Hello and welcome to the Change Gang Podcast with me, your host, Laura Ordeal. I'm here to help you hold on to your sanity and your soul as you move through big change in your life. I'm here to guide you, inform you, and hopefully help you to triumph over trauma and the long list of symptoms that come along with it. This podcast series is to bring knowledge, share stories, and open up conversation around hope for those of you that suffer with the difficulties that present themselves in your life from diagnosed or undiagnosed trauma. Labeled or not, I know you need help, and so do those that have graciously taken the time to have these conversations with me. So let's get to it. Welcome to the Week Change Gang. I'm so happy to have Lorna Jackson here with me today. She is such a wealth of information. I'm so excited to have this conversation. I set up a 15-minute conversation. I think we almost talked for an hour, Lorna, right? We did. I'll try to rein it in this time, but thanks for coming and having this conversation. I truly appreciate it. You're very welcome. It's an honor to be here and to talk to a colleague from the other side of the world. (laughs) I know. We are. It's already tomorrow for you. And so we just made it work, though. I love that. I love that we get to do this and that we do get to share the knowledge with everyone out in the world. I'm so excited to talk with you because you are someone who really impressed upon me the value of continuing education, continuing to learn and move in the circle that you're in. Because, yeah, you might go learn something, but then you're going to learn more and more and you're going to find something that's going to be even better. And you've done that over the years. You've done that for a long time now, yes? Yes, I have. I actually, after our little chat the other day, I sat down and I did a timeline of all the trainings that I've done. And I started back actually with the hypnotherapy back in 2003. And before that, I was doing a lifeline course, which is for people in crisis. The crisis line, I was on the phone for that. And that was all voluntary. And I was really interested in helping and learning how to help people. I've done a lot of things beforehand. I was a tarot reader and I was very much into spirituality and mysteries, sci-fi stuff and the occult and all of that. So I was studying a lot of things as well. But then I was at Lifeline for about a year or so. And while I was there, I actually found out about Gestalt psychotherapy and I decided to enroll in Gestalt. I think that was around 2004. And 2003, I went and did a a hypnotherapy training, five-day course with a fellow called Rick Collingwood, who is an Australian very well-known trainer here in Melbourne. He actually now lives in Thailand as well because he's retired. His claim to fame, he used to be on television a lot. If they had any queries about things related to the mind or whatever, he'd go on the morning show and hypnotize the crew and do all silly things. And he actually was contacted by Mel Gibson, would you believe? And he went to the States and trained Mel Gibson in hypnosis and hypnotherapy so he could practice it. He was interested in it. Fascinating. So I did Rick's course back in 2003 and And from then on, I started Gestalt as well. And from there on, I went and did a diploma in clinical hypnotherapy in 2004. And I just kept on going with my courses. I was interested in past life regression in the beginning. And I read Brian Weiss's books. And I was so fascinated. I wanted to prove to myself if that was real. That's what really got me going. And I thought, well, if I could hypnotize them, I'd know if they were real because I'd be asking the questions. (laughs) So I copied the script out of the back of one of Brian Weiss's books and I hypnotized a girlfriend and she went into a past life and started crying and telling me all this stuff and I went oh my god it must be real she's not making it up there's something really here so I'd done Rick's course at that time and I knew how to hypnotize somebody but I didn't know much about trauma or regression and I just brought her out because that was the best thing I could do and left it at that so then I thought well I need more training obviously that course I've done is not enough it wasn't enough I tried to help people to stop smoking and I didn't do very well and have a lot of success and I really want to know how do you get people to stop smoking there must be some special ingredient so then I looked in my local phone book and I found a college on the Gold Coast I was living in Brisbane at the time so the drive was about an hour away so I enrolled and I did 10 day training every day for 10 days with the college down there and she was really strong very strict and very down to earth trainer but every morning when we went in there we 
all used to be really scared of it. You know? <laughs> but we were determined that we were going to learn how to do hypnotherapy and how to hypnotize people. And she used to get all the students up and we would break up into pairs and practice our inductions on each other. But we'd have to come up as a pair in front of the whole group. So she would sit there with the notes and ask everyone to critique us as well. Oh, well, you could have done it this way. But you know what? That really helped. I look back now because our students that we have on our hypnotherapy learning hub, we have them online. A lot of my uh, live trainings, I copied that method and we're finding that they come out really well because they're learning by practice, practice, practice your inductions. Don't just read it from a script. You have to have it in here. Do you think that, well, obviously, if you worked on that crisis hotline, on that lifeline, you had a heart for helping people at that point. Do you think that moved you even more in the direction of working in trauma and working Working with the people that you do see really need that now? Yes, you're right. That was a trigger for me. And understand what causes people to get to that point where they've got no hope and that some of them were suicidal. Some of them actually did commit suicide on the phone, which was tragic. So I wanted to understand more about what was going on with people and was there a way to help them other than medication? Because on the lifeline, we weren't allowed to recommend people or refer to hypnotherapists. There was a list of psychologists or counsellors that we could refer them or different agencies to help them. But there was no hypnotherapy or alternative therapies, you see, because it's all mainstream. It was government funded or whatever. So I wanted, and obviously that doesn't work as we know. I mean, it might work for a small amount of people, but for the majority, they come looking for hypnotherapy when they've tried everything else. So yes, I've always wanted to understand people and help people. I tell you what, when I was reading the tarot cards and I was reading professionally at different markets and shows around my area. I saw a pattern of people's behavior and they would come back for readings after six months or so and they hadn't changed their life or their behaviors. And I could see this past and the present and I could see the future was going to keep on repeating if they didn't change stuff now. But they weren't. And I wanted to know how could you get people to change? There must be some way. So I guess Lifeline was part of learning about human nature and behavior. And then I went on to study Gestalt and then hypnotherapy. And then I found that I had the tools to help people to make those changes if they wanted to make the changes because people came for the readings, but I don't think most of them wanted to change. They just wanted someone else to do it for them or tell them some magical thing's going to happen. And it's not like that. You do have to put the effort in. You have to take the action. So yeah, I was frustrated with the readings or with that side. And that's what prompted me to find a cure, which I don't like to use the word cure because here in Australia, we're not allowed to say we can cure people, but we can certainly help them. You can eliminate trauma. You can eliminate the symptoms. You can eliminate the things that are causing issues. Whether you want, instead of cure, you can say, I can eliminate that for you. And that's what you do. That's what you do is you eliminate boatloads, the laundry list of symptoms that people deal with. And I find it fascinating. I love that it's not just that, hey, we're going to help you quit smoking. It's going to be all of the other things that you haven't mentioned, that you haven't talked about that you just deal with, the IBS, the pain, the headaches, all of those things that are there, even though you're like, I just need this one thing fixed. It's like, well, okay, but by the way, we're going to probably end up fixing all of this stuff in the process too. And do you find that happens a lot with people? It does if they're willing to come back for more sessions. If they're willing to, I do a four session program where I offer a little bit of discount if they sign up for that and pay up ahead before the first session of an individual's session is is a little bit more expensive. But I find there's a lot of people, because they're not sure about whether hypnosis is going to work or whether they can be hypnotized. And no matter what I say, they won't believe me until it actually happens to them. (laughs) So they come along thinking one session will fix them or they have somebody they know had one session and they never smoked ever again. But they don't realize that that person probably gained weight or drank more alcohol or still had sleep problems or whatever. Because you can't obviously address everything in one session. It's only just a small snapshot. I don't even do single sessions anymore unless you've been through one of the packages with me. Then we can add single sessions for something else or whatever else along the way. But I don't do just single sessions up front for that very reason that you just said. People don't think about that actually. Oh yeah, we fixed that. But did you notice that something else started to come and you gained all the weight or you drank so much more or anything like that? And that's 
that's not the work that you or I do. And I love that. You're pretty amazing because you have such a wide range of things because you do the regression and you do some of those other things in terms of not just regression in this. I wanted to say like past life regression or you do some of the soul work that is really important. So you kind of grasp all of the parts of the person that are dealing with trauma. How do you think that's different for you and with your client with that part of what you do? Well, I I guess I've got two very distinct sides to my business. There is the clinical and the clinical often those clients are not spiritual I have an intake form and I ask, are you religious? Do you believe in reincarnation? And if they say, no, no, I follow a religion, I can't go to suggest that past life regression therapy might help them more. I can't because they won't go there. They'll run off and think I'm woo and crazy or whatever. So I don't, unless they spontaneously go to a past life regression when I'm doing a regression, which I find is rare because I particularly send them down to the cause in the current line because I don't want to complicate it too much because they're minds are already confused and overwhelmed and all of that. So unless they actually come for a past life regression session, my clients are very in a different area. So I have two websites. I've got hypno results, hypnotherapy, and then I've got spiritual regression as well. I've also got soul regression therapy, which is my own brand of past life regression, life between lives training. So it depends on what they're looking for. And some of the past life regression clients, once I get into their story, which is often quite traumatic in the current life and they've got all these problems. Yes, we'll go to a past life, but I find it doesn't always change everything for them. So then I suggest maybe they want to come back and do some clinical hypnotherapy and they'll often sign up for four sessions to address their issue to help them to feel more motivated and whatever they need. So they work hand in hand, but they're not, they are separate businesses in a way. When you started to work with people with traumas, with the situations with that, did you just naturally naturally kind of navigate into that from some of the work that you did and say, yes, this is where I want to go. Because some people want, it can be in depth and it can be a lot when you're dealing with people with some really serious traumas. We're talking about people who get quote unquote diagnosed with things that some people say are not curable. You need to be heavily medicated or you need to be this. And you're working with those people at a level that is very different than what the outside world tends to think about. I guess for me, I didn't set out to to address trauma, I set out to address the issues that most hypnotherapists help people with, like stop smoking, alcohol, marijuana, sleep problems. I think back in 2003, that's what I was looking at, 2004 and so forth, just to help them. But then along the way, I start to uncover that they have trauma and my training wasn't actually in trauma. It was to address the problem. It was like, get them off cigarettes and off you go. And if you let go of some trauma, if that's what you need to do, but I didn't really understand trauma and how complex it is and what causes can be. That's something I've learned as later on where I've gone on and done more, not specifically trauma training, but training that helped me to uncover what was the causes of their problems and why they weren't changing. So I started to use parts therapy, ego state therapy, which I read some books and got some information, found a few scripts, mainly from America because there wasn't much available in Australia, even with training in that time of therapy here in Australia. So I started to practice that and I got better results, but I still didn't really understand how to negotiate the parts. I was getting the parts to talk to each other. I wasn't actually regressing them back to the cause, to the initial sensitizing event. So I didn't have all the pieces together. I was learning myself. Like I said, there wasn't any trainers here training that therapy. I would have had to go to the States and even then I wouldn't have known really who to go to. So I put that together and then I I discovered through my past life regression therapy training, someone told me about a fellow psychologist in Melbourne called Dr. Gordon Emmons, and he's a PhD psychologist. And he went over to the States and lived with John Watkins and his wife for a whole summer. And he studied ego state therapy with Watkins and learned everything. I mean, they've passed away now. So someone told me about Gordon and his book. He has a book called Ego State Therapy. So I got the book and I read that and I thought, wow, this seems to be the missing pieces, how I can talk, get the parts to talk to each other when they're in hypnosis. But he didn't use hypnosis, even though Gordon has a PhD in hypnotherapy. He's also very 
very much involved in the Hypnotherapy Association, one of the main bodies here in Australia. He doesn't actually use hypnotherapy because he's a psychologist and they don't really accept it as much as they do overseas. But anyway, I went along and I did his ego state therapy training and I had to wait about a year or so before I could even do that training because he was only training it in Melbourne and he was only training it like once a month for two days on a weekend and so you'd have to go down for over six months and that was very costly because I was living up in Brisbane. So we waited till he had enough interest in Queensland (laughs) for him to come up to Queensland and we went up to a country town where he went to train at the hospital in the mental health area and he had about half a dozen people that came there so we stayed there for the weekend and we did the first two days of the ego state therapy training and that was back in 2008 I did that and then he came every month and we went and we studied at the university St. Lucia University in Brisbane he had a room there and we all went there so I completed the ego state therapy probably over about six months and with the ego states for people listening and interested in that when you're talking about ego states you're talking about parts of ourselves that develop through time through trauma through in situations and they're kind of like little bus drivers in our subconscious and they're driving the bus sometimes and we need to have communication about where we really want to go how we really want to be and we can't do that until we bring those parts together is that how you would explain that once the parts of are working in a healthy way, they, they then become integrated and you, you feel healthy, happy. You don't have depression or anxiety or fear. I mean, obviously, everybody's going to have some issue to some degree, but you get over that in a healthy manner by talking about it, not needing to be dependent on drugs or medication. So the goal of ego state therapy is to find the, the ego state, the ego part that has the problem that holds the fear of whatever caused that. And and from my training, I learned that there can be up to 24 ego states or parts to our personalities. And I thought, wow, 24, there could be more, but some of them we're not aware of because they're underlying the surface states, the deep underlying states. There's an executive state. I'm in my executive state now, so are you, because this is the part we, we function with the most. But if I was to be in a situation where there was something scary, my fear part would come out and that fear part would probably be connected to something that happened to me when I was a child and would react that way. So it would take over. It's like when you have a part that comes out, you think, oh my God, where did that come from? How did I get so angry so quick? Because that part has never been settled or addressed or acknowledged. But when it comes out a lot, well, the person can't handle it. It gets angry at the slightest thing or gets overwhelmed, can't function, ends up with agoraphobia, can't go out the door. That's the extreme. And they take medication, drugs to subdue it. Well, that makes total sense, though, and especially for the people who are listening that something that you said right there is really key, I think, for people who deal with trauma and deal with PTSD, CPSC, all those lovely letters that they add to things, but so many of the other things out there, too, that I'm not even talking about. When they have that moment of, oh my gosh, what? why did I get so angry? What happened there? When you're looking at it from another outside of that, if you're the other person on the other side of that, you're looking at this person going, what happened? That's like a totally different person because it kind of is. They're like a Jekyll and a Hyde. There's two parts, but they can be more than one part. And often they use cigarettes to keep that part down. Oh, I feel stressed. I've just got to go outside. I'll have a cigarette. Or they get home and they've got an alcohol beer. It turns into 10 beers at night or two bottles of alcohol. And this is what I discovered with working with clients with issues like smoking, alcohol and so forth, that underneath there are all these traumatic things that have happened to the different parts of their personality. So I was wanting to understand how it happened and why as much as I could. And then I discovered some training that I could be part of in Australia, which really helped me a lot when I started the Ego State Therapy Training, which I ended up with a diploma. And then quite a few years went by, I practiced it. And then I got a phone call from Dr. Gordon Emerson's wife and they said, Gordon's changed his course. He's now calling it Resource State Therapy. And everyone who did the ego state therapy, if they want to, they can come on board and be taught the new way. It's much similar, but he's changed a lot. He's written a book on it now, and there's all these different parts to it. And if you're interested, you can come to Bali and update your training with Gordon. So I thought, yeah, Bali, awesome, because I'd never been to Bali at that time. And to be there with other therapists was a bonus. 
owners. So with my husband, John, because my husband is also a hypnotherapist and we worked in a practice together for many years. We both went over there and stayed over there for five days. And he brought us up to speed with the new training, which I found was really good. He itemized, he identified the different ego states and what they represent. Now, the states, there's baited. He calls them baited, which means wounded or hurt. So he's a psychologist. So he's put it all into psychology jargon, which I found a little bit overwhelming. And I didn't feel that I needed to remember everything. I just wanted to know how to do the therapy. Because as hypnotherapists, we're more into just getting on with the therapy. Well, I am anyway. But he had to make it quite a certain way for the psychology board to accept his training. So he made it into a full 10-day course. And there was no hypnosis involved in your awake. Your eyes are open. But then you close your eyes when you do the regression part. But there's the baited states. So they're baited in fear, baited in rejection, disappointment, and confusion. And those four are really whatever caused those states to form. And when you get down in the regression, you get to that part, then you can identify as a therapist which baited state they are in. A lot of them are fear, but there's many of them are in confusion because once you get down there, the child or the little child, they're totally confused. They've got no clue as to why they feel like that. They trusted their parent or what, whoever's the perpetrator, the interject, he calls it the interject, the other person or people, and they just are overwhelmed and confused. So when a confused part comes out when you're an adult, you're a mess. And then that's when you end up with dependency on a medication and then medicating that compute, but it doesn't really go away. End up with brain fog, they can't function. They can end up with aches and pains mysteriously coming out. It's continually trying to get your attention to heal, to come in and do the healing. And so it's using whatever way, and oftentimes it's uncomfortable ways, like overeating or alcohol, drugs, whatever soothing mechanism it can do. But then it also can tends to kick in and say, look, you're not getting it. We need to do something. And it might bring chronic pain or it might bring IBS or it might bring something where your body now is, you almost feel like it's going against you. And it kind of is because your mind, yourself, your soul needs the attention of that healing process. And so it's trying to get your attention. Absolutely. Think there's a protector part, you see. Always we have a protector part, but the protector part is often formed when we're young. So it's not protecting as an adult would protect. It's coming from a child's mindset. So maybe as a child, it ran off to the cupboard and ate some sweet biscuits or grandmother gave it a piece of apple pie with cream and a glass of milk. And that's what the protector will help the adult to do because they feel this uncomfortable feeling or whatever. So they straight away go home, start eating sweets. And then that apple pie and cream goes into other food. And so then they develop the habit on top of it. The habits have formed from something. They are not just created on their own. There's always a cause and effect, an effect and a cause. And I think that's so interesting because in conversations, actually in conversations I was just having, we talked a little bit about how a lot of times now you get kicked back on, on some of the socials or in some of the space about doing regression work or about thinking that you need to go down and it doesn't have to be that deep. It can be quick. You can do this one session. I do it all the time. It's going to be this. But what what often happens with that is kind of what you said about the smoking thing is that it'll kind of fix that one part, but then you have these other things that will start showing up. It's like a weed that's grown. You're trimming these little parts off of it, but you're not really going down and pulling that out. So have you found that the regression and going into that part of it has really been the difference that's made the difference? Yes, that's made the difference, absolutely. I mean, I use that same analogy with a dandelion. If you don't dig out the roots, it'll just keep on growing. And you can help one part, but what about the other parts? Now, I can share a little case study. I thought of this one the other day. And this lady came to me because she had a fear of cats. Now, she had no idea why she didn't like cats. She had no conscious memory. She was, I don't know, got no clue. She was overseas with her husband and they went into a restaurant and when they got inside the restaurant, the owners had a lovely cat and it was harmless, obviously, but she wouldn't go in the restaurant. She ran out. I can't go in there. There's a cat. So they had to move the cat out for her to go in. So that's how bad it was for her. She felt embarrassed, obviously, and she thought she needed to sort it out. So she came to see me. So I did my therapy with her where 
were because she didn't know where, why. Now, just doing a suggestion, oh, you'll no longer be scared of cats, you know, cats are your friend. That's not going to work with someone like that. That's my opinion. It might not be everybody else's, but mine, no way. Because I've done sessions like that in the early in the piece and they come back, oh, no, I still have the problem. So the way I address it is that I get them to tell me, well, she told me the story of the cat and how it's scared her in the restaurant. So that's my part that I can use to launch her back to where it began because the current story is really important and the feelings that she experienced when she was in the restaurant and the fear that she had with the cat. So I've got her into hypnosis and you don't need them in to be in a very deep level because they need to be talking. And I asked her to tell me again about the restaurant and how she felt. And I really got her to go into the feeling in her body when she was seeing the cat, which was, oh, I felt scared. Well, how do you feel in your body? She went hot, flustered, her heart was racing, all of those things. She wanted to run away, which she did. So that feeling was in, say, a chest or a stomach. So then I used the effect bridge technique, which most people, most hypnotherapists know, to magnify it and then count slowly going back to where that began, going all the way back to where you first experienced those feelings, not necessarily with a cat, but where those feelings of absolute terror and fear began. And it may be less than this, but go back to where it began or you felt this way. And I went back and then she started telling me, I said, where are you? I'm sitting in a chair in my grandmother's kitchen. I said, well, how old are you? She's, oh, I'm about six. And they speak as a child. She's no longer the adult. Now she's a child speaking as a child. Oh, you're sitting there and what's happening? Oh, my grandmother, she's cutting my hair. I said, oh, wow, that's awesome. How are you feeling? Oh, yes, I love my grandmother and everything's good. I said, well, let's move forward. See, everything's good. But what happens? Oh, oh, well, grandmother steps back and oh, and the cat's bitten her on the leg and there's a big commotion. And evidently grandmother stepped back on her own cat, didn't see it was there. Cat turned around, bit her on the leg and the grandmother angry at the cat, calling it all the names under the sun. It's all traumatizing the little child, little girl. Cats are evil, cats are bad. And God knows what the grandmother would say. This is the initial sensitizing event because she never had a problem with cats before that time because I also asked her, is this the first time you've ever had this experience? Yes. Oh, okay. And, and what happened also was the grandmother's wound didn't heal very well. So it went on with the grandmother and this little girl went to grandmother's a lot. So the grandmother was constantly reinforcing the bad cat. Cats are to be feared. So at that point, to remove the fear from the child. So this is where the interject is the grandmother and the cat. And the child is in a baited state of fear and confusion. She's confused because she doesn't understand the cat and she's fearful of all what could happen. So there's actually two parts to some degree of the child. But I got the child to dialogue with the grandmother and tell the grandmother how she was feeling so scared with the grandmother's reaction to the cat. And then the grandmother talks back through the child and says, look, I'm so sorry because I didn't mean to scare you and it was all my fault and I'm sorry because obviously it was. And then I said, well, now... What would you like to say to the cat? Would you like to talk to the cat? Oh, yes, cat, I'm sorry. You got such a fright and I love you. And and then the cat talks back. What would the cat say? If you were the cat, what would it say? Oh, and the cat would say, oh, well, I got hurt. I didn't know what to do. I tried to run away. You know, it's, it would. So you see, all of that helps the subconscious to see there's no need to fear. It was just a big accident. And once I've done all that dialogue and changed the story, then they all give each other a hug and off the they go, da 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 because the child is, how are you feeling now, little girl? Oh, I feel okay now. I'm clear now. I understand now. There's no more confusion. There's no more fear. So off you go with the cat. Have some fun. Grandmother's there. All is well. Come back to the adult part, the adult that came in, the fear of the cat. Say her name was Susan. Susan, do you understand now what happened? We've connected all those dots. Oh, I see it. I really get it now. I said, well, are you ready to let that go now? Because now you understand you don't need to carry that that fear, all those symptoms in your body. Yes. So then I take them through a healing release process rearrange the parts so the parts are supporting each other. There's a whole technique involved. This is only briefly. But then I take her into the future. So let's go now with this confident part of you now and then let's go to another restaurant with your husband and see how things are going. Oh, look, and there's a cat over there. What are you doing? Oh, I'm going over to stroke the cat. So there, straight away, it's changed. Now, and you can do one session if you know the issue and you can get straight back to it because that one 
was pretty simple for me anyway, because <laughs> I've done hundreds of these sessions. It's very cool when that happens. We don't always get all the information. That's the thing. They don't always know to tell us. They know they've got a fear of something or they just say she came with just anxiety and she didn't tell me about the cat. Or if that situation hadn't happened with the cat, but she just came in with anxiety, I would maybe have to do more digging and I may have to do more sessions. It depends on the client and how they respond. There's a lot of bearable. It is, but I think it's so amazing that you can guide someone and go back. It's so crazy because we don't think of things causing trauma in our life. Half the time we don't remember them, first of all. But even if we do remember a lot of it, it's just like, well, that was just life. That was just something that I dealt with. But it could be like that. She stepped on the cat and there was this whole big thing and now you're registered as, this is trauma. It's not going to cause trauma to you as a 30-year-old, but it did as the six-year-old. Absolutely. And I mean, it wasn't a problem unless she came across a cat, but she has to then constantly be wary of where she goes and if there's a cat there. And that's not a healthy life. That's not a happy life. <laughs> Always worrying and be looking out. And sometimes people think their anxiety or their phobias or their fears are silly or whatever. And so they just like, oh, I'll deal with it. I just don't do that. It's easy to go in and help clear that. And it's oftentimes important because again, like that dandelion, it might bring more stuff or other issues along with it somewhere along the line. So it's a good thing to go clear some of those. Well, the fear of cats can grow into then any animal, grow into all sorts of things like the dandelion keeps on sprouting. Yes. And then it can lead to alcoholism because of the fear or the pain. It's just really interesting how it works. There's always some underlying initial sensitizing event that's caused that set it off in a certain direction and generally it's not a healthy good direction. All right, Change Gang, that's the end of part one with Lorna. I hope you come back and listen to part two. But in the meantime, I want to share that discount code that you might have heard about in the notes. You can email support at hypnotherapylearninghub.com and simply say Laura's podcast and you will get a 30% discount with Lorna and John's teachings. So use that. You'll be grateful you did. She has such amazing stuff. So go have a look. Go have a wonderful week. And I'll meet you right here, same time, next week. Ciao. I hope today's episode was interesting and helpful to you in some way. If so, find someone to share it with. Maybe it will help them too. If you'd like to know more about anything discussed here today, you can find all the places to connect with me and the guest speakers in the show notes. Or go to lauraordeal.com, L-A-U-R-A-O-R-D-I-L-E.com, and you can reach out to me there. Until next time, ask when you need help, be kind to yourself, and have a happy day.